you look at the main focus of the meeting, the meeting is looking at phytate and its interaction on research in terms of amino acids and minerals. But my focus really is to, to look at the application into the industry and how the industry is using those uh, research into actual practical examples. If you look at the, the current legislation in Europe, for instance, there's a lot of restrictions on, on mineral usage, specifically zinc and copper. And so I think the understanding the interaction of the, the phytate, the copper, the phytate and the zinc and how breakdown of that phytate through superdosing phytase can actually maybe help or be part of the solution. So if we're going to talk about phytate and how can we maximise phytase utilisation, the one thing we need to know is what's in the, the raw materials. We've now got technology through NIR to have the capability to be able to measure the phytate quickly in raw materials and feed. And we talk about it being an anti-nutrient, and this is just a couple of trials. On the, on the left-hand side, you've got basically a trial we did in US in pigs from weaned to 21 days. We had a low phytate diet of 0.14% phytate phosphorus. And all we did was we went to a high phytate or moderate high phytate of 0.19 phytate phosphorus by just adding a small amount of rice bran. Rice bran's high in phytate. We used around about, I think it was 2.5% addition. And we did see a significant reduction in performance. And Wayengo from Canada, he did a study in semi-synthetic diets where he added no phytate and the high levels of phytate. And again, saw a reduction in average daily gain. So if what we'd say from superdosing phytase is we're saying it's defined as the addition of an ant's D. coli phytase at 1,500 FTUs of kilo or above while only taking generally a 500 FTU mineral matrix. What we're trying to do is maximize that phytate destruction as quick as possible to stop it accumulating and precipitating out some of the minerals affecting the amino acids that we've talked about earlier. We then can get down to IP1, use alkaline phosphatase to break that down and then reduce the inositol. We're looking at uh, basically a simplified view to phytate breakdown by phytase. We obviously know from what we've seen earlier, it's a lot more dynamic. But basically you've got IP6 and we've got a diet of 0.24% phytate phosphorus. If we get down to IP3, we're around, getting around about that uh, uh, half or 50% of the phytate breakdown of 0.12. But what Mike has pointed out is we start to get accumulation of IP4 and IP3. And what we need to be able to do is get that out of the system quite quickly because that's anti-nutrient. And so therefore, what we're really looking at is getting superdosing to get down to IP1 as quick as possible to prevent some of these uh, antagonistic effects of the IP4s and IP3s, as well as breaking down IP6 as quick as possible. So we're getting around about 83% uh, uh, phytate phosphorus destruction. The alkaline phosphatase then could come in and we can get the inositol and the last phosphorus off. So to get down to that 80 to 90% to phytate destruction, we really want to get down to this level as fast as possible. And achieving that, we can do that through superdosing of the phytase. There's a lot of data showing that we are improving neutralization by adding superdosing phytase. But what does it mean when we're actually out there applying it in the field? I think we've potentially got quite a lot of anemic pigs out there that we're not really noting. And that can link to low gain by around about 0.8 kilo, kilos at 21 days. And I think if we can increase iron and superdose, we can increase the iron status of the pig. It's with the hyperlithic sows is what's happening to the piglets in terms of anemia. And what you found at weaning, there was around about 34% of the pigs rather in that category. So I think this is a, a good opportunity to look at one, our iron levels, and then maybe how phytate, iron, and superdosing can interact. Again, what does it mean when you start looking at it commercially? And this is some work from the, the UK. And what they did was, they did two studies looking at the effect of adding organic iron at a, an extra 150 ppm over a standard, which is 200 ppm of iron. And basically, when there was no super phytase, superdosing phytase in there, they saw no difference in that level of performance. They then introduced the superdosing phytase, and they added 150 over the top of the, the diet. Again, same, same setup, but this time with superdosing. And all of a sudden, you started to see an increase in that performance of 10% in average daily gain, a tendency for improvement in fee conversion of 7%, and intake. And then what well, the interesting thing is, they did do some scour scores, and if anything, there was a trend down. And one, that's one of the concerns, because people are concerned about putting iron into diets, because it's, uh, it's a key nutrient for E. coli. So a higher iron can cause E. coli proliferation, which can cause scour. But what we're finding is in the data, generally that's not something we're seeing. The thing I think on trace minerals, there's a lot of pressure, especially from a European aspect on, on zinc and, and copper in particular. What we can do with zinc is low levels may be beneficial in terms of low phytate nutrition program. 
in enhancing nursery performance and reducing zinc excretion. So we can use the, the superdosing to lower that zinc, get the reduced zinc excretion, but still maintain or improve performance. And it just proves to me how important zinc is. Because in 2003, they actually put in a, a stipulation of 150 ppm of zinc as a maximum. And then in 2005, they reversed that to pharmacological levels by vet prescription because basically they couldn't cope with removing the zinc in, in the European market. But there's still pressure on to reduce that further zinc levels from an environmental and there's even antimicrobial resistance uh, uh, theoretically associated. We know how zinc oxide's used. It varies from uh, market to market, but anywhere from 1,000 to 4,000 ppm. Uh, effectively, it's looking after generally up to three weeks post wean in most cases. And then it's to prevent post-weaning diarrhea. I think the mechanism is still not overly clear, but tight junctions, antimicrobial gene regulation, and all those areas are being looked at, in particular to zinc. So one of the things we started to look at from a European perspective is, can we actually maintain zinc oxide at lower levels and maintain the benefits by using uh, the superdosing phytase? And if we do that, we could actually reduce the, the levels of zinc and, and reduce the excretion and actually, that might be, allow us to maintain that zinc oxide for a longer period of time and being proactive in that area. So adding phytase or superdosing phytase to these particular diets, you saw a response irrespective of the zinc. But the interesting thing was the actual maximum performance was at this lower zinc level of 1752,500. So this is 30% above this control. So what this suggests is you could actually reduce your zinc levels to 1750 to 2500, and actually potentially maximize out that response. So phytase is working at all levels, but maybe there's an optimal zinc uh, to phytate ratio that the, the, the phytase is gonna give you the maximum response. And then just as an example, and this is now happening a lot more in the European market, is if you go from 2500 to say 1750 in the starter, you'd actually reduce about the zinc excretion in the nursery by about 20%. And even on that saving, you'd be about $3 a ton. So what you can do is we can actually maintain that performance, lower the zinc, and hopefully that might, from a European aspect, maintain that zinc longer, because we do know there's benefits in, in the addition of zinc. Copper, again, from a European aspect, has been used at 170 ppm for, for quite some time in, in starter nursery. But now they're looking at reducing that to 25 ppm. And if you look at the, the use, uh, basically, You've got copper at 125 to 250 ppm, typically depending where you are in the globe. But the European work would suggest as you get below 160 ppm, you are seeing increased scours and poor again by dropping that, that, that copper out. So again, is there something we can do? We're at very low levels of copper at 25 ppm, so we're limited on, on what we can do. So as copper sulfate is used today, that was something we decided to look at, looking at again, superdosing phytase with and without different levels of copper. But each incremental level of, of copper, we did see a nice increase on the superdosing of the phytase. We did see a main effect of 415 grams a day through the nursery to 453. And we did even see a nice, thankfully, a nice response to copper. So at the zero copper, we saw 408. And at the 250 ppm, we saw 458 uh, grams per day of, uh, of, of gain. Because effectively, from a European perspective, we're here. Somewhere around about in between here, 170. So and going all the way down to actually basically a no supplemental copper. And then what can we do to try and get back? And maybe this is part of the answer to this low levels of copper in, in nursery feeds. With the low phytate nutrition program, I think we can achieve that by superdosing phytase. We know that phytate's negative. All the things we talked about today indicate the negative, and what we're seeing now is we're seeing the negative effects in the animal. So we can maximize performance and gain by removing it and getting rid of the IP6, the IP5s, and the IP4s. 